Um, I mean, maybe if I were a more formed personality, I would have actually managed to write the paper that I was going to write, uh, going to present today, rather than getting completely obsessed down a detour of another paper that I hadn't actually even planned to write. Um, the paper today is called Theses on the Revaluation of Value. And um, both the Trump non-paper and this paper uh, have to do with an element of my work that uh, concerns uh, power, theories of power, uh, and theories of ecologies of regimes of power. Uh, and I've been working on both, concurrent, both sides concurrently for a long time. Uh, both of them also relate to a concept that I worked on the first Half of my residency, I was working on a concept called mediation that I uh, presented in, in my Friday seminar. And that's the idea that uh, everything that is real realizes itself as an event. And therefore, all terms have to be reconstrued in terms of events. And that includes the idea of media. Uh, and to do that, it makes transition primary in relation to transmission. So I've um, uh, worked a lot, I worked a lot uh, this recently over those, uh, around those issues and how to bring that kind of re return to the formative field of events uh, into various levels of, of theorizing. Um, I've been the, the, the other, so in, in, the, in, the, in the Trump uh, work, I'll be trying to talk about how, like what, how you can possibly apply a concept of mediation to something that's so obviously mediated in the normal sense as, as uh, Trump's uh, manipulation of social media. Um, so trying to talk about what constitutes uh, a media event and what the um, role of media figures that are personified uh, have in that. Uh, this, this, what this paper is coming from, sort of another prong that's been building for the last three or four years on um, the theory of value. And um, that's trying to tackle the economy and economic mediations, once again, constrain in event terms, <coughs> uh, a set of vocabulary that allows us to understand them as immediately effective and performative uh, as forms of becoming that instantiate themselves uh, as such. So the interesting value uh, has recently um, sort of catalyzed around a project that we have at the Sense Lab to um, actually create an altered economic system um, that would be uh, involve a digital platform and a cryptocurrency. Um, these altered economic um, projects have uh, just proliferated in recent years. There's always been a certain uh, uh, line of development of them in various forms like local currencies, sharing economies, gift economies. Uh, most recently, the um, mention of Bitcoin and uh, ideas about reappropriating Bitcoin for collective economies based around common projects has taken off and created quite a stir among, among activist circles. So that's where our economy intervention is locating itself. It's been a struggle, partially because we knew nothing about economics in the narrow sense, uh, and we've had a very huge learn learning curve trying to, to understand uh, how economies work, um, let alone how blockchain works and then Bitcoin. But um, one thing that has been troubling us is the extent to which the, the kind of notion of economy that goes into these alter economy projects rarely manages actually to separate itself out from the conventional notions of economy that are part and parcel of the way the current capitalist economy works. Um, so we, we've, we've seen, for example, that there's a predominance of market 
notions, notions of exchange, the kinds of individualizing tendencies that come with exchange as a, on a transactional basis. Um, things that move in an individualist, libertarian direction rather than towards a collectivist direction that we want to move it. Um, I've also noted a, a real lack of um, attention to what constitutes the economy as a system, what the capitalist system, how it actually functions now. And again, a lot of very old notions can, can crop back up uh, in the absence of a um, very contemporary uh, attempt to talk about that. Um, so, what I wanted to do, I've been thinking over the months that we've been working on this, I've, just, I've been trying to reintroduce and try to develop a vocabulary that brings out some of the pitfalls of just coming back to those old concepts. Um, and it's began to revolve more and more for me around the interplay between the qualitative and the quantitative, the affirmation of qualities of existence, modes of existence and their qualitative character for what they are as values in themselves, and then the quantification processes that take those up and feed them into other kinds of processes that quickly turn exploitative and create all of the effects of, of inequality um, that, we, that we see uh, growing in the capitalist economy. So what I, what I did, I was uh, um, invited to write a 1500 word uh, intervention about this kind of topic for, for an online journal. And I sat down to write it, within a few days it had puffed out to 40 pages. Um, and uh, obviously I just had a lot I needed to get out. So I'm going to just read some of the beginning segments of it. It's not going to get very far in the, in the whole uh, trajectory, but it's going to uh, focus on uh, quantity and quality. Uh, and at the end, if I get to the end of this part, on the notion of intensity uh, factored into those, two, into those two concepts. So, um, so I'll just read what I have. It's in the form of theses. Thesis one, it is time to take back value. In many circles, value has long been considered a concept so thoroughly compromised, so soaked in normative strictures and stained by complicity with capitalist power as to be unredeemable. This has only abandoned value to purveyors of normativity and apologists of economic oppression. Value is too valuable to be left in those hands. In the absence of a strong alternative conception of value, it is all too easy for normative gestures to slip back in. Priorities are still weighed, orientations favor, directions follow. Without a concept of value, by what standards are these choices made? Usually none that are enunciated. Standards of judgment are simply allowed to operate implicitly. Normativity is not avoided, it becomes a sneak. This can prove just as oppressive. <clears throat> Thesis. To take back value is not to reimpose standards of judgment, providing a normative yardstick. That would do little other than to make the oppressiveness explicit again. Thesis. To take back value is to revalue value beyond normativity and standard judgment. More radically, it is to move beyond the reign of judgment itself. Thesis. The first task of the revaluation of value is to uncouple value from quantification. Value must be recognized for what it is, irreducibly qualitative. Thesis. The revaluation of value is as irreducibly qualitative must be insistently this-worldly. Appealing to transcendent values styled as moral qualities only raises the strictures of normativity to the absolute. Thesis. The revaluation of value is ethical by definition. That is why it cannot be moral. Thesis. To uncouple value from quantification means engaging head-on with the economic logic of the market Value is too valuable to be left to capital. Thesis. 
The dominant notion of value in our epoch is economic. The domain of economic value is conceived of as the market. The market definition of value revolves around the definition of money. The consensus market definition of money is threefold. Unit of account, medium of exchange, and store of value. Discussion. This actually, this definition actually skirts the issue of value. Since the store of value is nothing more than the quantity of units of account held in reserve, the definition is circular. The circularity spreads the concept of value across the three roles, equating it with the ability of money to phase between them. The result is an obfuscation of value, both of how it actually functions in capitalism, which cannot be reduced to classical market mechanisms and the market's central concept of exchange, and of what it might become in a revalued post-capitalist future. Thesis. The threefold market definition of money assumes that value is by nature quantifiable and posits money as the measure of value. These assumptions must be questioned in order to open the way to the revaluation of value. Thesis. The classical concept of the market assumes not only the quantifiability of value, but the myth of equal exchange is judged by the measure of money. This is the idea that one can get, quote, value for money, guaranteeing fair exchange. This fairness principle is seen to be the engine of the capitalist market. Discussion. The idea of equal exchange and getting value for money are aspects of the notion of money as measure of value. Money can be treated as the measure of value because it is used as a general equivalent. Some parts of this are sort of you know, very familiar Marxist <coughs> definitions that I use to extract what I'm doing a bit from, from the reigning capitalist notions, but then I need to give it a completely different spin and move into other, into other areas. Uh, so money use is general equivalent. The yardstick that allows incommensurable things to be commensurated. A fair exchange is when the use value of a commodity object is commensurate with its price. Having a fair price enables qualitatively different commodity objects to be compared. This enables, quote, rational consumer choice. In addition, the value of a present sum of money can be compared to a sum of money in the future, enabling, quote, rational life choices. The myth of fair exchange is undermined by the concurrent market logic of getting a good deal. In consumer behavior, the allure of getting more value for money is actually much more of an engine. This points to the reality that if you scratch the shiny surface of the market idea, the specter of unequal exchange immediately appears. It is with unequal exchange that qualitative understandings of value return to shape the foundation of the quantitative, sorry, it is uh, with unequal exchange that qualitative understandings of value return to shape the foundation of the quantitative vision of value. The goodness of the good deal is only partially reflected in price. The calculation of what constitutes a good deal does not only involve rational so-called considerations. The sense that more value for money is, sustained, uh, is obtained is strongly inspected <coughs> by the subjective factors of the buyer's dispositions, desires, and idiosyncrasies. These subjective factors cannot be commensurated from one consumer to another or from one purchase to another. They are singularly qualitative calculations, in quotation marks. There are also object lessons in the plasticity of value. The myth of the commensurability of the present sum of money with the future value is also undermined, this time by the tendency of the market itself to exemplify the, the plasticity of value. This is called volatility. Volatility is two-headed. It arises from factors endogenous to the market, such as cycles, and crises arising as complexity effects of the market's very mode of operation, speculative bubbles. It also arises from what are called externalities, which include such things as wars, natural disasters, and weather, or more radically, climate change. These are qualitative changes in the market's outside environment that are secondarily reflected in price changes in the market. Externalities also include price movements linked to valuations that are not, not exactly outside the market, but are not fundamentally calculated in money terms either. 
The classic example is the added value of location as reflected in real estate prices. Location is valued as an indicator of quality of life. Quality of life is not in itself measurable. Higher prices in a desirable neighborhood are a way of putting a number on the immeasurable. They numerically express an incommensurability. This suggests a connection between value and vitality that is reflected uh, in given quantitative expressions, uh, that is given quantitative expression of pricing, but is irreducible to that quantification because in itself it is directly qualitative. Subthesis. Actual market dynamics assume unequal exchange. The way the market actually operates in practice is predicated more on excess than on commensur commensuration, more than Trump's equal to. That's the only Trump that comes in here. <laughs> Subthesis. The more than unbalancing exchange is due to qualitative factors. Although reflected in price, these qualitative factors are and remain externalities to the market. They are another, of, the, of another nature than their quali quantitative reflection, presenting a non-numerical excess. They remain subjective, vital, equal to qualities of experience pertaining to quality of life. Subthesis. A revaluation of value must contrive to develop this connection between value and vitality that is presupposed by the market but disavowed by it. We must make qualitative excess a post-capitalist virtue beyond the myth of equal exchange, the fairness of the market, and the rhetoric of commensuration. Thesis. Distinctions between endogenous factors and externalities that are just used is ultimately unsustainable. Discussion. Everyone knows that fluctuations internal to the operations of the market fundamentally hinge on a certain privileged non-economic factor, affect. Markets run on fear and hope, confidence and insecurity. Affect is and remains uh, an externality, but what exactly does that mean? It's a complicated question. It cannot mean that affect is a factor that is squarely outside the scope of the economy, implying that it can be ignored in economic analysis. That would be to underestimate this constitutive force in market dynamics and to deny the long shadow that has passed over the discipline of economics from its very beginning. Did not Keynes warn his fellow economists against the, quote, underestimation of the concealed factors of utter doubt, precariousness, hope, and fear? Concealed or not so concealed, but nevertheless officially disavowed. Affect cannot be considered to be squarely outside the market, but neither is it a formal market mechanism that is recognized as inside its system. It is not an economic operator per se, it has its own nature and modus operandi, and they are qualitative. Affect qualitatively agitates the economy, but it also overspills it, extending to many non-economic arena. It forces itself upon economic calculations, but is not on itself. Market functions feel its force, makes its mark economically while remaining of another in excess over. <coughs> we can sum up the subjective, vital factors that are called externalities with the word affect. Affect is the name for factors that make their mark on market dynamics while overspilling them, that modulate economic logic without belonging to it as such. The best way to capture affect's fraught status uh, than to say that it is an externality, is to say that it is the market's imminent outside. The term points to the fact that there are factors that belong to capitalism's field, but do not belong to its system. It is to the imminent outside of capitalism that the revaluation of values must look to identify qualitative processes, now in embryonic form, that might grow into post-capitalist future. The question of affect is closely related to the concept of intensity, which is key to understanding the relation between the qualitative and the quantitative in economic terms. Subthesis. The contrast just made between the economic system and a wider process 
The latter continuing to qualitative factors constituting an imminent outside is a necessary tool for the project of revaluing value. Discussion. This expands and complicates the logic of inside, outside. A system demarcates itself from other systems and so doing delineates its operative inside from their externality. For example, the economy is systemically defined by a certain order of operations which mutually cohere. These operations are distinct from the operations mutually cohering in a technical system, for example, say a steam engine. But in addition to this internal-external distinction, there is an imminent outside as a category in its own right. The economy and the technology of the steam engine as systems are mutually external. But the steam engine drove the economy in the 19th century, and the economy drove the invention and proliferation of the steam engine. Each became what they became in each other's dynamic embrace. Across their systemic difference, they are both mutually included in the same two-faced movement of becoming. The movement of double becoming is a processual <coughs> coupling between two systems. The processual coupling belongs to neither system per se, but enters as a formative force into the becoming of both. It constitutes their imminent outside. Process is the imminent outside of the in-between of systems. But since it is unbounded by any system or set of systems, the imminent outside overspills systematicity as such. Considered in itself, its in-between is, is wide open. It is the expanded field of where systems becoming may go, beyond where and what they are now. Process is by nature in excess over system. It makes every system a, this makes every system a constitutively open system. This, between, this distinction between external, internal, external or exterior systems environment and imminent outside or processual ecology becomes extremely important for understanding complicity and resistance under capitalism. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is sort of open things out beyond a systems analysis but in a way that can also embrace systems analysis because there is obviously a systematicity to the economic system that has to be taken into account and a lot of the weakness in oppositions to capitalism is not going enough into what constitutes that. But I, have to, but I, I need to open it out into, onto, some, onto another vista where other logics can be found to be operative that, aren't, that, aren't, that may feed the system, be captured by it, but aren't internal to it so that we don't have to say either we have to step outside the system completely, which is impossible given the universality of global capitalism, or we have to beat ourselves over the head for being in complicity with it, that there's, that there's a kind of ontological condition of complicity uh, that we need to uh, work with. Subthesis. The excess that must be reclaimed and revalued for the post-capitalist future must be recognized as processual. Close attention must be paid to the systemic operations of capitalism in all of its arenas, consumer market, labor market, investment, and financial markets. However, system systemic analysis is not enough. The analysis must extend to the expanded, expanded field of process. The word field is a handy way of holding on to the system process distinction. The capitalist field can be used when the purview includes capitalism's imminent processual outside with system reserved for the operations of the economy in the familiar restricted sense as formalized by the traditional discipline of economics. Subthesis. The capitalist process is how the capitalist system dips into its own imminent outside to draw out new potentials for its becoming or continuing self-constitution. Thesis. Excess is written into the very definition of capital in its difference from money as unit of measure, medium of exchange, and store of value. Discussion. Capital is defined as the potential to derive from a present quantity of money a greater quantity of money in the future. Capital, thus, is not profit. Profit is the greater quantity of money derived. Capital is the potential to derive that quantity. That potential is the effective engine of the economic system. 
it emergently stirs in the system's imminently processual, imminent processual outside. The definition of capital exfoliates into four essential observations for the revaluation of value. Thesis. First, the capitalist economy is more fundamentally concerned with potential than it is with actual quantity. So this will enable me to say that, it, that it's a capture of potential and that, that potential, since it's not all in, even if it's completely complicit and captured, is recapturable for whatever it is. Discussion. Potential is a qualitative concept in that it connotes transformation. Capital, <coughs> movement of potential, is the quality of money as transformational force, or as a driving force of the system's becoming. The transformation counts economically only registered in the statistics. The numbers are quantitative signs of qualitative changes, changes in productivity, the changes in labor and management practices associated with increasing productivity, the life changes associated with the changes in labor and management practices, the increasing accumulation of wealth, wealth but also growing social inequality, the disruptions and opportunities of innovation, the accompanying cultural transformations, the appearance of new desires accompanying those transformations, new dispositions gelling those desires, the contingency of idiosyncrasies sometimes going viral. But the economic indexes index are life changes. They are disguised vital signs. The changes that index overspill the properly economic sphere. The potential of the economy is ultimately life potential. The question of value is a vital question. Capital has its invisible hand on the pulse of life. Thesis. Second, the issue of excess returns in the guise of surplus value. Surplus value is another name for capital as quality of money. And surplus value is a, is a term that's very central to Marxist economics, although it does tend to get quantified except by certain, certain currents within Marxism, but it's completely ignored by capitalist economics and by most alter economy projects. And uh, I think it's, it's something, it's actually where, the, where all of this has to go at this point, to generate something different. Surplus value names capital as the ongoing potential for deriving in the future an excess over a present quantity. That is, that uh, this, a not equal exchange or fair value for money, is actually the engine of the economy. And this means that surplus value is primary in relation to value, understood in terms of the market definition of money. This has enormous consequences for the revaluation of value. Discussion. Surplus value is a form of turnover, is the leftover of potential that drives the economic process forward. Profit is a punctual numerical harvest deducted from the surplus value, from surplus values, driving of the economy continuously forward across points of profit taking. When profit is taken and used for investment, it's plowed back into the economies driving by surplus value. Surplus value and profit turn over on each other, always leaving a leftover, an excess of unabsorbed surplus value for the future generation of still greater profit, unabsorbed potential. Surplus value is the ever more than, and again, of profit. sub -thesis. Surplus value is immeasurable. In and of itself, it cannot be measured. This is because being always by nature in excess over any sum of process of profit, it is supernumerary. Thesis. Third, the future looking definition of capital, i.e., the potential to generate a greater quantity of money in the future, means that capitalism is fundamentally speculative. The manner in which uh, capital is speculative makes it a power formation in its own right. Right, that is another thesis. Discussion. Capital is a time function. The time element is fundamentally non chronological, revolving around potential which is nothing other than a futurity in the present. It only secondarily concerns the measure of time. Primarily, it concerns time as the qualitative interval priming the actualization of potential. Speculation is not a perversion of the capitalist economy. It is of its essence. 
is its power function. Capital is the economic lever of the time of potential. As such, it captures the future, the future of vitality. Life's qualitatively in the making. It captures potential. In this capacity, capital operates directly as a mechanism of power. To say that it is a power over life is an understatement. It is a capture of life's in the making. It's very becoming. It's what I call, in other words, an onto of power. Um, so I started insisting on this because there's a lot of left responses saying the problem is with speculation and how speculation runs away with itself. And speculative markets are some kind of mutation of capital that, that uh, denatures it and that they're, they're, they're bad. Uh, so that we want to really cut back on them or cut them out in order to return to so-called real economy, the productive economy. Forgetting that the productive economy, it was actually where an economy of uh, fierce exploitation of life activity and uh, labor time. Thesis. The financial markets offer a better point of departure for post-capitalist ultra-economic thinking than money in its traditional market role as currency in the most cryptocurrency projects take off. Discussion. As proposed earlier, the functioning of the capitalist economy cannot be explained solely with reference to the classical market functioning of money defined in terms of equal exchange. It is in the speculative sphere, the sphere of the financial markets that the processual engine of the capitalist economy shows its true processual quality. It's ultimately unsustaining, running after surplus value, fueling endless growth. Aspirational and post-capitalist alternatives must translate <coughs> the traditional definition of money and the market exchange concepts it underpins or risk being outfoxed by, outfoxed by capital from the get-go. They must generate notions more akin to surplus value than to money in this threefold definition. In a sense, they have to be more faithful to how the capitalist process actually runs itself than market ideology is. The better to turn this dynamic in the way it is said in zombie movies, that dead bodies turn. Except in this case, it is the inverse, a rid of revivification. The turning of the turnover of capitalist surplus value requires the altered value, value in a self-driving process. It requires the affirmation of an analogous dynamic quality of process, but one that does not lend itself to the quantification of the irreducible qualitative that is what operates capitalism's economization of life. Subthesis occupies surplus value. Thesis. A word for the altered value that could drive the post-capitalist process is creativity. And a lot of people can discussion. The choice of creativity is made in full cognizance of the fact that neoliberal capitalism has appropriated the term. Innovation and creative capital are buzzwords signposting that appropriation. Surplus value is the engine of creative advance of the capitalist system, but the quality of capital's creativity is best captured in a related phrase which expresses the inherent violence of capitalism's economization of life's qualitatively in the making, creative destruction. But what of life's in the making proper, life's in the making considered as such, vitally instead of economically? What of the creative advance of life as it complexly applies its fields of emergence? that imminent outside of the capitalist system, whose qualitative differentials capitalism data mines for conversion to its own ends. Vital process, too, is self-driving. It, too, self-iterates, turning over on itself across its punctual expressions to continue pace. It runs on excess, serially set forward. So that the um, emphasis on excess is to try to get away of notions of scar scarcity as necessarily under undermining uh, an economy and the idea of self-driving is to try to say that there's a certain kind of animacy or animism that has to be returned to or recognized uh, in order to, to uh, move forward. Subthesis. In other words, there's a qualitative surplus value of life that provides the fuel for capitalism's qualifications. Subthesis. 
Economization is the conversion of one kind of surplus value, surplus value of life, into another, capitalist surplus value. Subthesis. Qualitative surplus value of life is processual given to the capitalist system. If it can be given, perhaps it can be taken away. Even aside from its withdrawal from quantification, it can be rejoined upstream of its conversion. It may be possible to have one foot in both stream <coughs> streams. Thesis. Capitalism is coextensive with economization, the process by which the qualitative field of life is economically appropriated and subsumed under the principle of perpetual quantitative growth. Thesis. Understanding the economic system is one thing, understanding the process of life's economization through which its system's operations feed themselves as an apparatus of capture is quite another. Thesis. The key to revaluing value might reside in reverse engineering a dynamic that is carried to its highest power in the most advanced and seemingly regressive segment of the capitalist economy, the financial market. The speculative engine of surplus value might provide the model for the revaluation of value. It may be necessary to go right for the heart to drive a stake through it, to make, to make it by, uh, to make it live up to its potential or potential, to make potential live up to its vitality. Thesis. What is a quality of life construed as a value? The answer is simple. A qualitative life value is something that is lived for its own sake. Something that is experienced as a value in and of itself in the unexchangeable currency of experience. Discussion. A life value has value to the exact degree to which it is incommensurable with any other experience. It is a singular color of an experience, such as it is, all of its own, that makes of it a life value. In fact, a quality of life has value in exactly the way we say a color or a sound has value. It has the value of the qualitative character of its own occurrence. Subthesis. The use of the word occurrence is not gratuitous. Quality of life as a value lived for its own sake is eventual. To reclaim it amounts to folding the non chronological time of capital back into the eventfulness of life's qualitative in the making. Um, so the last part I'll read is about intensity. And when I'm talking about surplus values of life, I'm talking about an emergence effect, where there's a complex relational interaction among elements. But then above and beyond those elements and their simple aggregation, there's a qualitatively different effect that just sort of spins off, or pops up, or just emerges, and then creates a certain level of existence of its own, where other operations can, can happen. Um, so that excess effect has to do with the way certain tensions, interferences, resonances between contributed story factors play out in a way that's not reducible to the sum of their parts. That's intensity. Thesis. There's a difference in nature between intensity and quantity that needs to be taken into account uh, to understand the economization of the field of life. Discussion. Temperature. This is a very long example, and I'll, I'll sort of end with that. Temperature provides a template for understanding the distinction between intensity and quantity. Compare 18 degrees centigrade on a sunny autumn afternoon to 18 degrees on a rainy day in spring. The temperatures are the same, but the weather conditions factoring into each is entirely different. Upstream of the registration of each temperature lies an infinity of factors belonging to different registers and scales. Friction between particles, rays and refractions of light, streams of wind, water evaporation, heat concentration and dissipation. So I'll have to do differentials and gradients. The composed the weather as differentials. The state of the weather spreads across them, taking their many dimension difference up into itself without erasing it. Each weather state 
adds to its own different, adds its own difference to theirs. It adds its unique emergent quality as a result of the conditioning difference. Multiple contributory factors hold, fold into the weather to make its difference as an integral emergence effect. The way in which the factors come together to yield a spring temperature of 18 degrees is entirely different from the way in which they come together to yield the same autumn temperature. And we feel the difference. They affect us differently. The way we integrate our conditioning factors is singular. We feel their respective singularities. We feel cold in the autumn temperature and bask in the same spring temperature as the long winter begins to break. We are part of the relational mix. Our affective state resonates with conditioning factors, registering it on a purely qualitative scale. That scale develops its own differentials. The quality of each state of the weather is singular, but in its singularity can be discerned a number of mutually involved qualitative dimensions that differ in nature. Some level of the affect, seasonableness, comfort, the sense of the passage of time, bodily <coughs> reawakening in the spring, a him of the hunkering down for the coming winter. Call the differential of the multiple conditioning factors is registered in a singular qualitative feeling integrating its own multiplicity of contributory dimensions and intensity. Our affective state registers with the intensity, uh, resonates with the intensity of the weather. The thermometer registers the same two weather states on a numerical scale. It factors out the qualitative differences in a single figure. A single figure does not take the singularity of the qualitative natures into itself. In itself, the singleness of the figure annuls the singularity of the weather states along with their compositional differences. Actually, maybe we'll stop. The, like the example goes on and on, like my examples often do. So I might stop it here uh, just to uh, explain a bit more what, what the stakes are for me. So I've talked about quantification processes as, that underwrite econ the economic process as a form of capture of something that's qualitatively different and constitutes a kind of ontogenetic outside and outside of becoming broader than the, the economic, the economic uh, system. Um, and on that quantitative side, there's a kind of, the intensity is, in its qualitativeness is left behind. And there's a, a numerical indexing of it. And that is in a sense a kind of surplus value of the, uh, of, of that field of emergent a relation and emergence, but it's one that turns back on it in order to feed <coughs> the numbers into other kinds of systems and processes, for example, meteorology, uh, into weather forecasting, all kinds of regulatory and um, explanatory frameworks. So there's a kind of annulment of the affective intensity and the qualitativeness of life's a life on its emergent level that gets captured and moved into other circuits. And then we think that by studying those circuits, we've understood the whole process, but we've forgotten the most important part of it, the part where potential resides. Um, but then there's what I wanted to try to do in this last section is say, well, there's certain ways in which, even in that, even in outside, in the field of emergence, there's a way that it's registering itself but purely qualitatively, and then I wanted to use the concept of affect to talk about that, where there's a kind of, it's a kind of enveloping of the conditions and, and, and another emergent quality that stays totally qualitative, has its own complexity, um, but it doesn't separate itself out. It's part of the event. It's immersive and participatory. It can be separated out in memory, and then maybe uh, inserted into other circuits, but when you return to it in memory, you're returning to the feeling tone. You're returning to the qualitative aspect of it. So, so it remains qualitative. So it's a kind of standing out of the field of relation in its qualitativeness that allows higher level functionings to happen. Uh, so I wanted to show that there's sort of a differentiation within imminence that creates a lot of room to maneuver because those affective states we can register as emotions we can manipulate them in our memories. Uh, we can know how to return to them in some way or try to, try to, try to make them uh, return 
but you know that it's always going to be with a new variation and that, that in a sense it's going to be an improvisational or creative process. Um, so the sort of giving, uh, trying to open up a domain of pragmatic intervention in the field of emergence, what I call in the field of emergence, dealing with qualitative different differences that um, just opens up a whole field of practice that's not yet captured by capitalism. So I was going to be complicit with it, have to couple with it in some way, might be captured with it, but still there's that moment of moving into the imminent outside to bring something else out otherwise. So in our economy project, that's what we were trying to do. We're trying to use this concept of intensity um, because even in the concept itself, there's a kind of double-sidedness where it has that, it, it has that quality of the differentials, intentions, uh, composing it. But at the same time, we think of it as having magnitude, and, and in philosophy there's a lot of discussion of intensive magnitudes. Um, so if you look at it from the underside, it's qualitative, but if you look at it from the other side, from the side of, that allows it to be pulled into these circles of quantification, it's quantitative. So it's kind of a hinge dimension. Uh, so we want to try to exploit that double-headedness of intensity to build our economy. So the idea is that we can put, I'm not going to try to go into too much detail, but what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do is create, is to use developments out of blockchain technology um, to become the, so we create a digital platform that's sort of the pivot of our, uh, of our projects, which have, to, which have to do with creating alter educational projects that are event-based, improvisational, collective, and building on creative synergies that are relational instead of on individual inputs or individual pro products. And we want that to function in the creation of improvisational events, creative events. But also we want to harvest traces of those events in digital form, <coughs> alongside all the digital discussions and collaboration and the distance and various ways we use digital media in order to organize ourselves to be able to do something in the non-digital world. So we want to bring those traces all together and not treat them quantitatively, and not treat them as documentation of forms that, that, that we've made, but to treat each one as a little point, differential point and to try to find ways of registering the differentials between them qualitatively in a way that some of the factors are spread, differences in frequency, differences in tendential leaning, um, differences between embryonic and fully fledged tendencies, etc. So we want, we want to create something that registers intensity directly in affective terms. Uh, sorry, we're experimenting with something that we're calling the an effectometer, uh, which we're going to be working on. Uh, we have like three programming teams working on on these problems, and, we're going, and the event that we're having at the end of August will be about about this, about how to register intensity in ways that allows to be quantified without erasing its qualitative nature and while keeping the process of the interaction focused on the qualitative. Uh, process. So then uh, this will, platform will be part of a sort of a kind of environment of other common space collective projects that are also creating their own economies and cryptocurrencies. And what we're trying to do is figure out a way where we can operate on affective energies and synergies internally without having an internal market, without having individual shareholding, without having trend transactional exchange, but having creation of collective events that, that move trans-individually. Um, but at the same time, you want to be able to harvest numbers from it that if we look from the outside, can see what we've done in quantitative terms so that we can have a cryptocurrency that is minted by our intensities of interaction, but then participates in this environment of other currencies in ways that allows it, to, and since it's given a number, it can then be converted so that we can have 
exchanges between other economic systems and other projects. And then all of the systems are undergirded by yet another cryptocurrency that operates more traditionally, um, which is also a kind of, which means it also becomes a speculative market, which is what Bitcoin or Ethereum have become. Uh, and then having that undergirding allows us and the other economies to move our creation of value into the traditional cryptocurrency world and from there into the outside world of national currencies. So basically what we're trying to do is mint money out of affect. And it's, it sounds fairly crazy, but like I was saying in what I read, affect is really what drives the economy anyway. Um, financial markets are more and more unanchored from any direct proportionality to underlying assets or any direct linear causality between them and its valuation. It's sort of taking, it's taking, um, taking flight from them and operating on those affects of precariousness, utter doubt, fear, hope that Keynes talked. It's almost purifying the affective element of capitalism and finding ways to make it into a speculative endeavor that creates surplus value out of the turnover of abstract financial instruments that never or rarely have to land back in the productive economy, although they can, they can never cut totally that, that tie. But, it, but the um, center of gravity of the economies moves more and more toward that unanchoring in these new modes of surplus value production through very abstract forms of, of unanchored capital. Um, and that's become like the, the pilot, it's taken on the piloting role in the capitalist economy. The value of the financial markets far out the value of the productive economy now. Um, so I guess if, if, they, if they can operate in such directly affective <coughs> terms without acknowledging it, maybe if you do acknowledge that that's possible, we can create other terms to operate in. So it's, 